Zero. I'm currently a housing specialist with the City of Wichita Housing and Community Services. Uh, this afternoon, I have the pleasure of introducing our presenters for the City and Center Affordable Housing Session. Sally Stang joined the Housing and Community Services Department as its director of the City of Wichita, Kansas in July of 2019. She formerly served director of Housing and Community Development for the City of Tucson, Arizona for seven years. Prior to serving in Tucson, Ms. Stang held multiple positions over 18 years with the Lake County um, Housing Authority in Illinois. Sally has a bachelor's degree in business administration from the University of Phoenix, and she served as vice president of the National Association of Housing and Redevelopment Officials, also known as NARO. Tara Steele is a shareholder in Gilmore and Bell PC. She joined the firm in 1999 and practices in the Wichita office. Ms. Steele received her BS in business administration from the University of Kansas in 1983 and her JD cum laude from Arizona State University in 1986. Ms. Steele entered law practice in 1986 and associate with the Kansas City, Missouri law firm of Blackwell Sanders, Matheny Wary, and Lombardi. In 1990, Ms. Steele joined the law department of Coke Industries, Inc. in Wichita, Kansas, where she served as general counsel to Coke Oil Company and legal counsel to the Chemical Technology Group. Ms. Steele's practice emphasizes financing for state and local government capital and economic development needs, including serving as bond counsel on a variety of general obligation, industrial revenue bonds, and lease purchase financing. Ms. Steele is a member of Kansas, Missouri, and Wichita Bar Association, and is admitted to practice before the United States Supreme Court. Troy Anderson currently serves as the Assistant City Manager for the City of Wichita. Troy has over 17 years of experience in local government, having served now, but also in Nebraska, Texas, and Missouri. Troy is well versed in the area of public and nonprofit administration, economic development, development services, and code compliance. Troy has considerable experience in dealing with elected and appointed officials, as well as the general public, and thorough knowledge of the process and procedures. Dominic L. X. and Bell PC. He has practiced. In 20, Ms. Reck earned his BBA in accountancy, cum laude, from the University of Notre Dame in 2006, and his JD, magna cum laude, from the Washington University of Law in 2012. While, the law school, while in law school, he was a YDN scholar and a member of the Washburn Law Journal. Mr. Reck is a member of the Kansas and Wichita Bar Association. We also have Tim Goodpasture and he will tell us a little bit about himself in just a few seconds. A quick few um, housekeeping tips. There will be a videographer and a photographer recording and taking uh, photos of the session. If you do not want your picture taken, please let me know. I'll be sitting in the back here. If you have any other needs, I'll also be here to assist in any way possible. Please join me in welcoming our panel this afternoon. Thank you. I'm too good past year. I haven't accomplished anything yet. So, uh, I didn't decide anything again. So, I've been with the city as an economic development analyst for uh, 12 over 12 years and had an extensive career in commercial real estate, uh, focusing largely on investment real estate uh, before I got into government work. And that's our session. <laughs> okay. Um, Again, my name is Troy Anderson, uh, Assistant City Manager for uh, City of Wichita, and I'm a pacer. So you'll have to forgive me. I'm gonna I'm gonna pace a lot. Uh, pleasure of working with folks over the last several months, um, and so we are really excited to kind of bring this session to you all here today. Um, with that being said, we've heard a lot of really good data-driven conversation today. If you all haven't heard Jeremy Hill before, I'm telling you, I, I love it. I can sit there and listen to this guy talk all day, right? So uh, you've heard a lot of data-driven stuff today. This is going to be a little bit of data-driven stuff, but a lot of this is just going to be kind of policy, legislative type of stuff. And so um, take it for what it's worth. So I have here up on the slide that 
proverbial three legged stool, right? When we talk about urban growth and we talk about sustainable urban growth, we're really talking about sort of three key factors, right? There's there's others, but for the most part, you can't have a healthy, sustainable urban growth model without these three pieces. That's goals and objectives, the public investment, and then obviously the private investment. So let's start with for just a second. So this starts at the state level. We have the state level, hands down to local level. We have to establish what we call a comprehensive plan first and foremost, right? That comprehensive plan is um, full of all sorts of uh, goals and objectives. Could include parks and recreation, could include police, could include all sorts of things. The one I want to talk about a little bit is future land use policies. And in particular, an urban infill strategy. So back in uh, 2015, there was a 2015 to 2035 Wichita uh, Community Investment Plan. That's what we call our conference plan. As part of that, there was an urban infill strategy. And that urban infill strategy is a follow-up to that. You guys have probably all heard of this before, was the Places for People Comprehensive Plan Amendment. In that plan amendment, took a couple of years to get through, got a lot of community feedback, a lot of stakeholder engagement, introduced a couple of concepts. For example, the lynching analysis provides us some sort of language, right? When, when we talk about things like paths and edges and districts and nodes and those kind of things, those are planning terms to help us make sure that we're all kind of saying the same thing, right? But there were a couple other really um, interesting uh, kind of key components of that Places for People plan that continues to kind of build on the foundation of what we're, or what we're all trying to accomplish uh, with urban infill, right? First uh, was the neighborhood investment framework, right? And you've heard some of this today, but there's a free market investment. Alongside that comes this adjacency momentum, which then builds communities get community development out of that. It's this progression. You can sort of see this progressive, um, and, and this is played out. This is sort of tried and true, tested model, right? That there's this progression. That if we want to see sustainable community development, it starts with free market enterprise, followed by adjacency momentum, and we see then community development. This one was a little bit new as part of the places for people, right? It looked at a lot of the census block, census tract data, and established what is called um, these neighborhood areas, right? And so within here, you'll see formative areas, flourishing areas, and maturing areas. And it's sort of that progression, right? And the formative areas are those areas in, in most need, right? So based on census block, census data, data demographic information, we had, in fact, there was a map that came out of that places for people plan. You see the areas in red are the formative areas and progressively worked up to emergency, emerging, flourishing. And then maturing is obviously one of those areas that free market and the adjacency momentum and the community development is robust and thriving. That's the maturing areas. So then we go on with goals and objectives. We take that comprehensive plan and government, we like to create a lot of rules and regulations, right? So we do. We create zoning codes and subdivision codes, site development codes, building codes, property maintenance codes. We create this framework in which the other two legs of this proverbial stool get to work. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about public investment. And to fine tune that to the conference forum here today, right? There's a couple of different aspects. You, you heard a little bit uh, of this probably throughout the day. We're using things like housing price or housing in the, We're using content, uh, uh, terms like housing stock, housing type. So we're going to kind of walk through each of these here a little bit, but primarily we're going to focus on that, that top one, housing price. Oftentimes we throw around the term affordable housing really loosely, right? Everybody says, we need affordable housing, we need affordable housing, we need affordable housing. It's true. But when we talk about affordable housing, we talk about affordable housing in two different contexts, right? 
we talk about affordable housing as it relates to the world that Sally plays in every day, right? And I'm going to hand the mic off here in just a second to let you talk. Uh, I'll let Sally talk about affordable housing as it relates to things like the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, area median income, fair market rents, low-income housing tax credits, subsidized, right? And so I'm going to hand the mic off to Sally Stang, but then I'm going to come back after Sally done, and we're going to talk about not affordable housing, but housing affordability, right? Or housing that's attainable or housing that's achievable. We want to make sure that we did make that distinction because we can't blend the two, right? They're two totally distinct conversations when it comes to housing. And there's a big conversation about housing in general. That's why we're all here, right? But we want to make sure that when we're talking about affordable housing, this is what we're talking about. Thank you, Dre. I too am a pacer. <laughs> I can't stand still, so I'll be dancing up here a little bit too. Right. So from the Housing Community Services Department, we actually have 42 different programs run out of our offices, 42, with about under 60 staff. We try to maximize the resources that come into the community, marry them up, and put out programs that have the biggest impact for the community. But in the realm that we're talking about today, about housing and housing affordability. Some of the key programs that we have, obviously, are the Community Development Block Grants. That is our most flexible form of funding that we receive. There's actually 101 eligible uses for Community Development Block Grant. In short, everything we do with it, though, has to meet a national objective to serve low-income households, prevent slum or blight, or deal with an emergent urgent need that's like a, a natural disaster. We also have home funds. Home is a second source of funding from HUD. Home funds are all about building affordable housing. It's about units. I shouldn't say building affordable housing. It's about units. It's about affordable housing units, either building them, preserving them, or providing tenant-based rent assistance. Pretty much sums up what you can do with home funds. We also have Home Arc this year, which is um, a, a, a sub set of home funds that came out of the American Rescue Plan Act. We'll talk about these a little bit in detail. We have ARPA funds for our affordable housing fund that came again from, from the ARPA program. And then we can use Section 8 project-based vouchers. These are all tools in our toolbox out of housing and community services that can be used to help develop or preserve affordable housing. So currently in our, uh, you know, Troy talked about the comprehensive plan. Don't confuse that with our consolidated plan, right? So for the HUD programs, we are required to create a five-year consolidated plan. And in that is a very comprehensive process. We spend about a year doing public engagement. We are starting that process this summer to have our plan ready for July 1st of next year. Uh, but currently in the realm of building affordable housing, where we have resources um, using community development block grants, is, is infrastructure improvements and high priority funding areas. So we actually identified the areas in orange on this map as high priority funding areas. There are low to moderate income neighborhoods that were needing investment. And we have money set aside in community development block grant to support infrastructure projects. And and just an example of that, um, we provided CDBG funding to the, the Habitat for Humanities Rock the Block effort in creating um, a draining. They had a drainage itch issue. We were able to go in and put in storm sewers so that project could happen. So that's just an example. We have another project moving forward with the Parks Department to rehab a park in a low-income neighborhood. That would be infrastructure that could support and, and be an asset to affordable housing development. The other areas of CDBG we have are the Homeowner Emergency Repair Program. So we provide $5,000 grants for emergency repairs in owner-occupied properties. We have a Home Improvement Loan Program, which allows a little bit of a bigger investment in, with an interest buy-down program. There was a lull in the use of that program for many years. You can imagine why, right? People could go to the bank and get a pretty low interest loan. Well, we're just seeing that turn around with new interest rates and seeing a little bit more interest in that program. We have a rental rehab program. We can provide loans to landlords to repair homes if there's the, the commitment to lease up to low to moderate income households. 
And then we have a historic loan program where we can provide loans for the rehabilitation of historic properties. As I said before, the Home Investment Partnership Program is all about affordable housing units. So we do housing, we provide gap subsidy for affordable housing developments. In the past, we've done a lot of assistance in single family infill development. Um, more recently, we have provided gap subsidy for a couple of larger projects, such as the Timbers uh, Cerebral Policy Research Foundation, their uh, reconstruction of their project. And we just provided a conditional commitment for MAKO to build an additional 50 units of senior housing. So the other thing we also do with this source of funding is provide home buyer assistance. So we have a down payment assistance program for people, low income homeowners moving into their first homes. HOMARP is a new source of funds. So under the American Rescue Plan Act, HUD made available to the city of Wichita just over $5.5 million in HOMARP funds. Purposes, um, including the development of housing and services, but with a specific target to those experiencing homelessness or other vulnerable populations, such as those fleeing domestic violence or victims of human trafficking or at risk of such. Um, in order to get access to those funds, we had to develop a plan. And so we spent several months with the help of Development Strategies Inc., who's in the room today. Thank you, Andy. Um, to create our plan, we submitted that to HUD, and it has recently been approved, and we're moving forward. We have an RFQ out on the street right now um, for a developer partner to work with us to develop um, housing, a navigation center, and non congregate shelter for those experiencing homelessness. Pretty big project. If you're interested, let me know. Um, I'll forward you the information about the RFQ. Uh, but yeah, that is our plan. If, to use not just those Hallmark funds, but to leverage them with other funding. We're looking at, right now, we're looking at about a $30 million project. So very exciting. Um, well, in the future, we'll be issuing RFPs for partners. So uh, operators of the shelter services, property management of housing units, et cetera. Then we have the ARPA Affordable Housing Fund. So many communities, depending on their size, received allocations of ARPA funds. Um, and the city will approve a $5 million allocation of the state and local fiscal recovery funds it received for affordable housing. So we're very excited to be able to use those um, in conjunction with the sale of public housing units we're trying to, to dispose of. Um, but we found some challenges in the regulations related to their use for affordable home ownership. And we're working through that process with Treasury right now, and we're hoping to launch those very soon in the future. And then the last piece that we have that works well and can be an asset to any developer looking to build affordable housing is our ability to issue a Section 8 project-based contract. Now, that's something that this, this housing authority hasn't done in the past. I've done this many times. They're a great asset to a project and that it can provide long-term subsidy. And similar to the Section 8 voucher program, it provides rent assistance to the person who lives in the unit. Where with the voucher program, the assistance stays with the resident. In a project-based contract, the assistance stays with the unit. And so building the unit, oftentimes um, in, in when a developer is trying to gather all sources of funding, the fact that there's a Section 8 contract associated with it provides that um, sense of security for long-term success of an affordable housing project. So we we can do contracts for five to 20 years, renewable for another up to 20 years, um, but we do have to go through a competitive process in order to issue one of those, uh, but it is a, of great value to a potential project. So those are the type of resources uh, that we have available coming out of the Housing and Community Services Department. So I'm gonna hand that up. Thank you. You're welcome. Clear. Yep. Thank you. I also am a pacer, so it's ironic <laughs> that all three of us have to present to the city council behind the podium where we stand the whole time making a presentation, mm -hmm. and apparently that's very unnatural for all three of us. So, 
All right, I, I'm going to talk about city incentives and uh, kinds of things that we can do as it affects housing. And um, we're going to go th through these. They're very high level, uh, the information that we're going to go through. So feel free afterwards, if you have any questions, to stop any of us. Uh, if you have a specific program that you want some more information on, we're certainly happy to do so. And I'm going to point out uh, Sarah Steele and Dominic Eck on the end down here. 95% of what I do, uh, they're involved in, so um, they're really much more knowledgeable about these programs than I am. So uh, they're great resources for us at the city, but they're also great resources for anybody that's interested in any of these programs. So uh, we're going to talk about uh, housing affordability. A lot of what we look at is census driven. Uh, there's a lot of incentives that are coming out right now that are census track based. And uh, so that does direct how and where sometimes the incentives are going because the government in some capacity, whether that's us, the state or the federal government is trying to direct resources to certain areas for certain things. Uh, the housing affordability index is something else we work with. And then we look at market rents and we look at kind of market rents across the board, everything from affordable to brand new uh, market-based uh, projects. So uh, we're going to talk about the types of incentives that we have. One incentive we have is a property tax exemption. So you'll see that listed as PTE. We also have property tax rebates, which is a PTR. Uh, we're going to look at a chart here to show you how these kind of fall out. Uh, we also have sales tax exemptions that we can use on projects. Uh, we also have a sales tax rebate ability. And then we have uh, special assessments. And are you all familiar with special assessments? OK, I see some of you nodding no, so I'm just going to go over that really quickly. We are unique in the country. There are very few places that use special assessments anymore. And the best example I can use, the easiest example, is a new residential development. When you do a residential development anywhere, almost anywhere other than here, the developer has to put up all of the money to do the infrastructure, the streets, the water, the sewer, all of that. Here in Sedgwick County, you can actually use special assessment financing where the cost of the streets, the water, and the sewer are paid by a special assessment that's assessed against the property for 15 years. So all of that infrastructure gets spread out between all of the lots in the residential neighborhood, and then it's assessed uh, again over 15 years at the government that's issuing the bonds rate. So it's a very cheap rate, but the residents that own the house pay for that over 15 years. So that's what special assessment financing is. We use that in different ways than, than, than in the residential subdivision. And then we have fee waivers and expense reimbursements. The incentives we're going to talk about are community improvement districts, uh, which have to do with retail sales. We're going to look at uh, and special assessments. We're going to look at industrial revenue bonds in a couple of different ways. Uh, the neighborhood revitalization area, uh, tax increment financing, and then again, special assessments. So Community improvement districts can use uh, sales tax rebate, uh, where after the fact, uh, taxes can be rebated to a developer for certain costs, and you can use special assessments. This is a new program that we're really working on right now that could be uh, a really interesting deal with um, housing and how you could redevelop housing or develop new housing. Uh, industrial revenue bonds come with a property tax abatement and a potential sales tax exemption. Uh, the neighborhood revitalization area is a property tax rebate, so people make improvements to their property, and then based on the incremental increase in value, that comes back to them over a period of years after the improvements are made. And we'll go through some of these in more detail. Uh, tax increment financing is a property tax rebate, and then special assessment is a special assessment. So community improvement districts, um, this is adding additional retail sales to a district, uh, can be used for or mixed use projects. Uh, CID can be used to pay a wide range of uh, costs, including some ongoing operating costs of a development. Uh, CIDs may impose retail sales of up to 2% or a special assessment tax for 22 years. And again, the special assessment tax can be used to renovate property. It can be used to build new property. There's a lot of different ways that this CID with sales tax uh, gets implemented. It's something that we're working on that we're really excited about. Industrial revenue bonds. We have two ways that we can use industrial revenue bonds as it relates to housing. One is through low-income housing tax credits, uh, and the other is through downtown redevelopment. If a developer is doing a 4% low-income 
project, uh, which is approved through the Kansas Housing Resource Corporation, not through Utah, uh, they are required to use a tax exempt bond financing. And in tax exempt bond financing, we're not talking about a tax abatement. We're talking about a lower interest rate to serve the bonds to pay federal income tax on the interest they earn on their bonds. Therefore, they can waive that and lower their interest rate and still get a same return on investment. Uh, so it's a way the federal government is trying to help uh, spur on uh, affordable housing. And so most developers use the Kansas Development Finance Authority to do their bond issues, their tax exempt bond issues. We in the city like to do them ourselves for two reasons. One, we like to know who's doing business in our community, uh, because if we get to know them, maybe they'll enjoy their experience here and come back and do uh, additional deals. I'm working on a project right now, a fifth project with a developer out of Denver who buys uh, uh, projects that are geared towards seniors and individuals with disabilities and rehabs them, usually properties that were built in the 60s or 70s. And um, we joked on his first project while we were working through it. I said, well, when are you going to get your second one? And he said, well, actually, I'm looking at one. And it's become this running joke. We're now working on our fifth, and he's already looking at a sixth and seventh project. Uh, and then also we can offer a sales tax exemption on a tax exempt bond financing, which the Kansas Development Finance Authority does not have the authority to do so. So we can add additional value to make it even more affordable. Industrial revenue bonds for downtown redevelopment. A lot of the re downtown redevelopment, a big component of what's happened is the city offered a sales tax exemption on the project. And when you look at seven and a half percent on a multi-million dollar project, that's a pretty substantial savings. And so a lot of the projects where you've seen an old office building converted to a hotel or an apartment complex or a lot of old town that have been converted to offices, retail and all that, uh, a, a huge portion of those have received uh, sales tax exemption through the use of industrial revenue bonds. Um, typically, you're seeing offices or warehouses converted to some sort of a residential use, often mixed use where that first floor is retail or restaurant or something else. And we have been using this for a very long time for downtown redevelopment. So neighborhood revitalization area. So this is, we talk about census tracts. This is uh, geared towards uh, neighborhoods that had an urban renewal plan or have some sort of a neighborhood uh, revitalization uh, plan in place. And a lot of that is census tract driven. Uh, and the way that these works is someone goes in, improves a property, the base year that they improve the property is where their taxes are held for a period of time. And any increase in value, the additional taxes that are generated can be rebated back to the developer to pay for some of those costs that they heard in their project. <clears throat> And you can achieve 75 to 95 percent uh, rebate based upon the size of the project. Uh, special assessments. Uh, one of the projects we have is asbestos and lead based paint removal. A lot of older projects uh, had asbestos and lead based paint that were used to wrap ducting and whatnot. A lot of them had plastic tiles that had it in them. And so when you renovate a project that has that, you have to uh, remediate all of that asbestos and lead based paint. And to do so is very expensive. Uh, one of the biggest ones I can think of that we did was what is now called the Lux, the former Kansas Gas and Energy Building at Market and First Street. Uh, it did both of these in their project. And it provides uh, like special assessment funding that I talked about spread over 15 years at a low cost because it's the borrowing rate of the government. This is the same way. The cost to do that remediation is spread as a property tax against the property for 15 years at a low interest rate. Fee and waiver expense program. Um, did anyone see Chris Labram, our director of Metropolitan Area Building and Construction Department, to talk today? Did he talk about this? Yeah, I'm sure he did. He's a good guy. Um, we took a particular area. Troy showed a map at the beginning of the established central area. That's essentially Rock Road on the east, 31st Street on the south side, Ridge Road on the west, and 29th on the north side, where we're looking at where we have existing infrastructure and trying to encourage people to develop or redevelop in those areas so we don't have to put new infrastructure in. So this plan was implemented last fall to encourage uh, uh, construction or reconstruction of residential properties whereby uh, the building and construction department would waive fees for building permits for any residential project. And if it was a multifamily project and had to pull a commercial building permit, it would uh, give them up to a maximum of $10,000 in waived fees. Um, so that's been an interesting program to track. 
So again, we went through all those at the top. We have one uh, that is a relative new one. And as I was having a discussion with Dominic just before we came in here, is a is a an ever-changing or potentially changing landscape for what that was called the Rural Housing Incentive District to encourage redevelopment of basically second floors of downtowns in rural communities due to a shortage of housing. <clears throat> It has now been included for urban areas. So Wichita, Topeka, and Kansas City can now use it. And literally just a few days ago, the, the legislature renamed it the Reinvestment Housing Incentive District. And what it does, much like a TIF, it captures the increased value generated by redeveloping an existing property. So if you're in downtown and um, you buy a three-story building and rehab it, uh, the conventional wisdom has been the second and third floor if you're converting those to housing or redoing housing, you could use this program for it. Uh, it is typically restricted the first floor uh, from being residential, although Dominic was telling me that that may be changing. There's some consideration that there could be some different ways in which this program gets used. So we'll have to wait and see what happens there. Uh, the properties do have to be 10 years old, 25 years or older uh, today. And uh, again, the second floor and up. And so the developer fund funds the project, and then over a 25-year period, they can re be reimbursed for certain expenses. And it's pretty liberal in terms of the expenses. It can be new HVAC, it can be flooring, it can be ducting, it can be walls, it can be all manner of things. So it's pretty wide open in terms of what they can be reimbursed for. But the reimbursement is based on any incremental new taxes that are generated above the base year that the project was complete. Tom, anything you want to add while I'm here on that? You got it. Okay. I'm going to turn this back to Troy now to let him pay some more. Thanks, Tim. Yep. Okay, I've been doing this for 17 years and my head hurts, right? <laughs> um, this is a lot of information to take in, right? Um, there's obviously a demographic amongst the uh, participants here today, right? Of, you know, maybe you're a, a tenant, maybe you're a landlord, maybe you're a nonprofit, maybe you're a developer or investor. Um, hopefully, we've ran through a little bit of the gamut, right? Of maybe dabble in affordable housing, right? Making sure that we're saying exactly that, that it's, it's an affordable housing type of Maybe you're just dealing in housing in general, right? And you're trying to respond to a market demand of a, a price point or a, a market rent that is more affordable, right? Um, what we just kind of walked through and described could be entirely affordable housing could be a blended approach, right? A lot of the tools that Tim went through, we, we see a lot of developers use in combination with the tools that Sally and affordable housing and HUD has to offer, right? And then obviously there's just kind of a macroeconomic conversation around just constructing housing and bridging the gap. You, you, you heard the rising cost of construction, right? The challenges associated with labor. Um, and all of that lends itself to housing that's just not affordable, right? And so this is where the government can help come to the table and help bridge that gap. So I'm going to move on for just a few minutes and talk a little bit about housing stock and housing type, uh, because you've heard a little bit about this today. Some of these programs lend themselves to both, right? Um, and then the last here in the housing type, I'll get into create just to try to get your mind thinking a little bit differently about what we talk about when we talk about housing. But when we talk about housing stock, right, there's a whole spectrum. There's preservation of existing housing stock, right? You, you heard a lot of commentary probably today of there's going to be a real pent up demand that we have existing housing stock. We have vacancy in our existing housing stock. We can use these tools and resources and simply preserve the existing housing stock that we already have. $30,000 towards an existing home goes a long way, right? $30,000 towards a new home is kind of a drop in the bucket, right? So there's a whole spectrum behind what, what is it that we're trying to accomplish, right? It's got to be both, right? We've got to preserve our existing housing stock. That's going to lend itself to 
both affordable housing and housing affordability, but as well as we're going to need a whole lot of housing units in the next five to 10 years, and that's going to come at the expense probably of new construction as well. Okay, so housing type. One of the things we keep hearing today is housing, 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 a home, a home, a home, right? And for most of us, right, we all think about that either on one end of the spectrum, we think about that single family residential home, right? Maybe it's a two bedroom, one bath. Maybe it's a three bedroom, two bath. Maybe it's got a garage, maybe a dozen, preferably a white picket fence, right? We all have that idea in our head. And I'll be the first one to tell you, I'll stand here and I'll say all day, I wholeheartedly agree. Home ownership builds generational wealth. It does, that's a fact. But here's another fact, not everybody wants to buy a home. Right? We have a whole generation out there. There's a lot of really good information out there. For a statistic one, a third of the population does not want to buy a home. They're okay renting, right? So then our mind obviously goes right into multifamily residential. And we think about these great big, huge multifamily residential apartment projects, right? But there's a whole spectrum of housing types in between, right? You probably heard this term, and if you haven't, you're going to hear a lot more of it. Missing middle housing. And the irony is missing middle housing not only talks about density, but also income levels, right? That that missing middle housing, we're talking about not just duplexes, but fourplexes, courtyards, cottage houses, townhouses, right? We don't have enough townhouses in this community. You can get scale and you can get density taking advantage of existing public infrastructure in maximizing missing middle housing. Okay, so we've talked about goals and objectives, right? What are we trying to accomplish? Begin with the end in mind. We've talked about the tools and the resources that we can bring to the table, to public investment, right? The most critical component though is going to be the private investment. That's, that's the one thing we unfortunately don't control. We don't do that kind of project work. Well, we dabble in it. <laughs> Um, but very little, right? Very little of housing is actually done and paid for by government, right? Ninety, probably ninety-five percent of housing is private sector driven, private free market driven, right? So without private investment, none of this happens. Okay, so let's just keep an eye on the time. Four forty-five. Man, we got probably time for. A few questions. So, anybody have any questions? Yeah. Any reasons why I came today is because I want to learn about those HUD houses that you plan on selling. Because I'm living in an apartment. I I took many years thinking, oh, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to have to go out and live or do a thing. But now, after I've lived in an apartment and do that apartment time, finally, I want a house. And I would also like to be able to, because there's so many of them, be able to maybe take several of those houses and either do Section 8 or provide home care for elderly or and train families or somebody how to take care of it and how to build better quality in the families. I'd like to basically turn it into business, but I want to know, one, I want to get out of where I'm at. Did everybody hear the question? Okay. Update on the sale of the public housing single family homes. All right. So, yes, it is our intent, still our intention that we uh, are going to sell all 352 of the single family homes in our public housing portfolio. Um, we have run into several challenges um, in getting those applications approved with HUD. Um, some of them are just uh, environmental review related. I was actually surprised how many of the homes that we have that are actually on property that are under or, or over, I should say, a groundwater flume. And so we are having to do extensive uh, environmental evaluations and testing um, before they are eligible to even have the application go to HUD to get permission to sell them. So we have an application in and um, we're working on the next and we're working through the environmental uh, review processes. So that first group of 37 properties, those are just being sold on the open market once once we get that final approval. That's 
they are all over. They are true, what we call truly scattered. And that's part of the reason we put them out just on the open market because they don't make really a viable project because they are scattered throughout the community. They're in locations, most of them, where there's not another one anywhere nearby. Um, so that was part of our thinking and just being able to put those on the, on the general. Our second application that was approved by the PHA board um, is 43 properties up at 25th and Minnesota Ash Pyatt. Those, yes, we're still working um, a couple of issues on that one. Those will go out actually under an RFP, um, a, a request for proposals. And we're and that's where some of our um, some of that ARPA funding, affordable housing funding, we want to make funds available so that um, developers could come in and purchase homes to and then make affordable housing funds available so they can be rehabbed and sold for affordable home ownership and or affordable rentals, okay? So that challenge, um, so the regulations around using ARPA dollars for affordable home ownership come with a 20 year repayment requirement, which in our community right now, when you look at the level of investment needed to bring those homes up to code, um, puts families upside down until after year 15. And we realize how unreasonable it is to, in this day and age, we know people just aren't staying necessarily in their homes for 15 years. And to put them upside down, meaning they will end up having to pay more than it's worth at the time is irresponsible. So we're trying to figure out a different mechanism to still be, have the investment so that the repairs can be done, but not put homeowners at risk. So we'll be moving through um, groupings of properties and be making different groups available in different ways. At the same time, we're actually rehabbing um, some of the units down in South City. So down in Catalina Del Mar area, um, where we're working with contractors to actually do the renovations on those. And those will then, once those renovations are complete, the application to HUD, and then again, sell them for affordable home ownership or for affordable rentals. That are still occupied that have a tenants in them will be sold with the tenants in them or one of them no they uh, the tenants relocation is part of the project plan so the tenants are already under our relocation plan and been made aware that the hard part is the timing we thought group one would have been done by now um and it's not and so they're they are aware they would be relocated they actually do have first right of refusal though and so we've been working with the, re the existing residents for over a year trying to identify who might be home ownership ready and connecting them to pre-purchase resources and HUD housing counseling um to, to so that they have that opportunity to buy the home that they're in any other questions for any of the panelists here today you get into the, you know, RHID, the reinvestment housing center district, you got to talk over there. <laughs> there you go. Thanks, Alan. Uh -huh. Any other questions? Well, we probably got about seven minutes left. So um, unless there are any other questions, we might give you all seven minutes back and, and let you enjoy this wonderful weather we're having before it turns south. Uh, so thank you again for coming out today. We really appreciate it. Uh, you all taking the time to come out and listen. Thank you. Thank you. Some reminder real quick. Yep. Don't forget about the reception tonight from the uh, Realtors of yeah. South Central Kansas. It's just like two blocks from here. Hors d'oeuvres, cocktails. Hope to see you there. Yes. <laughs>